chapter of Turing machines. This is uh, at the point at which we start discussing machines that are meant for studying computability much more than for parsing and scanning. The evolution of Turing machines itself is the one of the most important parts of uh, CS history and uh, the historical events that led to the formulation of a primitive machine that can represent the ultimate embodiment of mechanical computation is uh, very interesting. Turing's own words are that a human computer, and those days the notion of a computer was a human, human computer at any time carries out arithmetic operations on a 2D piece of paper and Turing says the 2D nature is not essential so why not reduce the computations to a 1D computation on a piece of paper governed by systematic rules this is what a Turing machine is and uh, there was a challenge issued by Hilbert asking scientists to show that uh, all mathematical questions can be answered in a mechanical fashion by computational devices. Kurt Gödel proved that this uh, program of uh, Hilbert is not possible by showing the fact that some logics are so powerful that they cannot be complete unless they are internally inconsistent. Turing further proved that all algorithms can be expressed by mechanical devices. So that allows us to simulate Turing machines using other Turing machines and this is nothing surprising these days because we have virtual machines and interpreters but those days it was a novelty. So now if uh, Turing machines can simulate other Turing machines why not imagine a single Turing machine called H or halting decider that given another Turing machine and its input will tell whether M running on W will halt and I'll show it this way for now or M running on W will diverge or infinitely loop and never come back. So this is the setup we want to feed a machine a Turing machine actually a program and uh, the program input to another Turing machine or a program and it should say yes if uh, M halts on W otherwise it should say no if M cannot halt on W will not halt on W this can be shown to be impossible to realize because uh, of simple arguments of uh, how you can feed a certain variant of H into, into itself and confound itself. And it is reminiscent of um, Gödel's statement of a logical system becoming so powerful that it can encode formulae which assert that the formula is false. These um, theoretical developments will be scratched in chapter 14 and 15. We have to now absorb the notion of Turing machines. Several other universal computational formalisms were introduced. Scientists trying to really push on this idea. All of them were shown to be equivalent to Turing machines. So, non-determinism doesn't change the power of Turing machines. A finite state control equipped with two unbounded stacks is universal. We will show how it can model the Turing machine tape. Even having a one uh, way, I mean, a single unbounded FIFO queue makes uh, equipped with a finite state control gives us uh, undecidability. So think of uh, infinite uh, FIFO queue such as that where the front is here and the rear is here let us say 
and the user has access to the front and rear and the user writes a program which is operated using a finite state control much like push down automated programs they can query and remove items from the front and they can uh, insert items in the rear and the queue can bulge towards infinity in this fashion even such a system is undecidable or universal in compute power the two stacks analogy is coming soon that's a very similar deal you have a finite state control equipped with uh, two stacks that can be pushed and popped the idea being that you can roll from one stack to the other and vice versa and end up viewing this entire arrangement as an infinite tape and once that uh, simulation is uh, successfully carried out with respect to all the Turing machine uh, related steps then this also becomes a, a universal device many other single instruction computers have been proposed in the literature just one instruction for a computer and just carry that instruction repeatedly with of course different arguments and then you can write a universal program which can simulate any other program let us see how to simulate an infinite uh, Turing machine tape using two unbounded stacks so you might imagine that uh, the two stacks are uh, facing each other such as uh, shown here schematically for a stack that contains um, a b b on top and another stack uh, qp with uh, q on top in one step a turing machine can uh, change items on a tape and let us so imagine a turing machine tape also containing a b q p if say the turing machine wants to write on the location pointed to by q these activities of the Turing machine will be explained in a second but uh, bear with me and I think you already know what to expect of a Turing machine and let us say that uh, it wants to change Q to an X and then let us say that the Turing machine head has to go right we can then uh, carry out that activity by taking the Turing machine stack I mean the two stacks that are simulating the Turing machine tape and uh, making sure that we end up observing X on top of the stack that's what the net result should be and then um, what else should happen the Turing machine head should be staring at P when the action is done so X should have been the thing under the head while the right was going on and then the Turing machine head goes to the right so we can create that world by essentially having an X appear here and then this uh, letter should be gone and the Turing machine head should be here so that uh, connection between the stack and the Turing machine is portrayed here and we can easily accomplish that by pushing X on uh, the left stack and popping the right stack so we pretend that we are always looking at the top of the right hand side stack and we maintain that invariant similar move in terms of a Turing machine trying to write given a b uh, QP let us say that we want to replace um, Q with X and move left then what should happen is we should uh, end up staring at the symbol B at the end of the process and it can be accomplished as shown here where we simply capture L stop left hand side stop which is B 
pop the left hand side and then push X and B on the right hand side stack. So the stacks would then look like A for the left stack and BXP for the left stack and again the situation of having written an X and then moving left has been simulated. The third possibility in case you have a Turing machine that can write and stay put at the same location is shown here. So with all that we get an idea of how data structures such as stacks and queues can be used. Two stacks or a single queue can simulate this actual Turing machine which is the standard form of presenting Turing, Turing machines from now on where we, we, we will assume for in our book that the user given input W is situated starting at a certain position. The Turing machine head has an I component and a pen component. You can think of these little spines as the scribe marks using which the eye can also turn around and write on the Turing machine tape. This is of course the single fiddler crab eye that can look at a tape. Infinite sea of blanks to the left, infinite sea of blanks to the right and finite state control. This is the recipe for Turing machines. We have been asked to write a proof for infinite queues simulating Turing machine tapes. <coughs> Having K tapes doesn't change the power of the Turing machine. So if you have a single finite state control acting on K different tapes where in each step you can do different things to the tape. So maybe when one tape you can write something and move right. In another tape let us say you can write something and then move left. In the third tape let us say you can write something and stay put. All those actions can be simulated on a single tape <coughs> by dividing the cells of the single tape to have a simulation point for tape 1 cell being stared at is put here. Tape 2 is uh, cell being looked at. So now you have a multi-head affair. There are one, there is one head here, there's one head here, there's one head here. All the heads that are being looked at are being put in an interleaved fashion. And you can modify the control program for the single tape Turing machine so that it mimics the activities on tape one, tape two, tape three, da da, -da tape k. Taking k steps to carry out what this uh, Turing machine may have done in one step, but the k fold slowdown in terms of uh, uh, Turing machine actions being slowly simulated, one is to k slow down doesn't really matter because in Turing machines and the study associated with Turing machines we only keep uh, termination non-termination sort of information we don't keep the actual complexity and constant bloat polynomial bloat these don't work these don't matter and in the next chapter or in chapter 15 I think 16 I think when we study <coughs> NP completeness, <coughs> excuse me, the theory of NP completeness, we will not be bothering about uh, polynomial differences. Even there, only exponential differences matter. But for these chapters on decidability, even exponential differences don't matter. So if you were to ask, if you were asked to write a <coughs> sorting program for a Turing machine. You could even have a non-deterministic process that uh, tries all possible arrangements and then checks whether the items are sorted. That would be a fine Turing machine program if it helps you carry out some proofs simpler. 
So any attempt to simplify Turing machines is really not needed uh, unless um, it also simplifies proofs that you write. <coughs> so Turing machines are structures consisting of a set of states, an input alphabet, a tape alphabet, a transition function, start state, tapes, blank cell, final set of states. Blanks are not part of the input alphabet and we will use uh, the period to model blanks. <coughs> we will not have an infinite sea of blanks. We will only allocate eight cells uh, to begin with and actually we will load the user input so we will only allocate as many cells as the user input needs and uh, maybe allocate a few extra cells nothing to the left and then when the Turing machine attempts to step off its tape we will I'll add some more tape so we are going to simulate a demand paging system for an operating system where the memory pages are brought in only when needed <coughs> this way we can maintain the Turing machine tape as a string W and then add tape as and when we need much like a runner getting the track on which to run as they are about to step on an empty spot suddenly a piece of track appears all right so <coughs> a Turing machine can be deterministic where um, given a state and a tape cell being stared at it goes uh, and uh, writes a new symbol on the tape assumes a new control state after moving left, right or the same. A non-deterministic Turing machine simply has a power set of these possibilities so um, it could take multiple alternatives from a single state where this might say go left, change it this way, this might say go right, change the cell this other way this may say stay the same, change the cell a third way. <coughs> All those non-deterministic possibilities can be folded in. We will be considering such machines and in Joe this is how deterministic actions are specified. So in state Q5 upon seeing a Y under the head the decision is made so the fat semicolon comes in and then we change the y to a 3, move right and assume state q11 and in a non-deterministic action we might stay at q10 and if we are looking at a 1 the decision is made we can go and change the cell to a y, move left or if we are looking at uh, zero, um, the second possibility here is uh, if we are looking at a blank, we leave the blank alone and then move left. <coughs> or the third possibility expressed here is uh, if we are looking at a zero, we change it to x and move left. And so happens that in all these cases, the next state attained is Q8. So that all can be encoded in a simple single line like that. With that, we are able to use a markdown syntax to express Turing machine steps. And this will be the non-deterministic uh, delta function, which has three possibilities. This would be the deterministic special case of a delta function which has only one possibility. So we will not belabor the deterministic versus non-deterministic distinction too much when it comes to Turing machines. A Turing machine accepts if it is stuck. Till it goes, gets stuck, it cannot accept. Whether it read the input or not is unimportant. The Turing machine may have read only parts of the input, may not have even touched the input, 
may have copied the input to a convenient spot and then who knows whether it will return to take nibbles at the input because um, it's not possible for it to, for us to predict or even algorithmically say whether a Turing machine is ever going to come back and read an input cell again because the Turing machine may have gone into a loop or we can't even tell whether it is in a loop. The loop can be a zigzag motion that never ceases in size. So with all that going on, we cannot rely on or we cannot even meaningfully define a Turing machine necessarily having to consume the whole of the input. And uh, the Turing machines are not required to read the inputs uh, once left to right. They can zigzag and read uh, some more input and then zigzag and then read uh, still more input etc. So the Turing machine's uh, acceptance is not tied to how many times they read the input, in what order they read the input and how much of the input they read. All that is not uh, specified as part of the acceptance. So all you need to do uh, say whether a Turing machine accepts a string W is fire it up starting from the left end of the tape that is looking at uh, the string with an infinity of blanks to the right and the left and soon after some time if and when you are lucky to see the Turing machine get stuck it can be stuck in an accept state or in a non-accept state if it is uh, found to have halted in an accept state uh, in a, a double circle state you say accept and if you find it to have uh, gotten stuck in a non-accept, uh, non-double circle state, you say reject. That's all is needed. Of course, uh, for most uh, Turing machines that we that we meaningfully compute, uh, it will have much better behaviors than this. But even so, when we have Turing machines that um, have to process uh, more complex patterns. So let us think of a simple uh, pattern of having to match W and W. So if the W is 0, 0, 1, 0, and then the other W is 0, 0, 1, 0, that's the entirety of the input. And the Turing machine can be reading this uh, 0, scoring it off, and then marching. While it's marching, it is reading, but it's not reading in a meaningful way it has to hop over and then find a certain point at which uh, the other zero lies. There could be a middle marker or it could be a non-deterministic guess and then it comes back and then reads and scores off and then comes back and reads and scores off. So th this is how a Turing machine will oscillate on the um, tape and uh, be able to accept things like WW. So with all that going on in the steering machine might, uh, after doing all that, find itself in an accept state, in which case you say, aha, you are now accepting patterns such as WW. It is just a computer program written with respect to the tape, and uh, we can declare acceptance when the program successfully finishes. And for all algorithms where clearly we can check for WW matches using algorithms, um, those uh, <coughs> strings are in the language of the Turing machine implementing the algorithm. And so we already have shown why the transitions are like this and slightly simpler than a PDA. One input character or a blank. And so if you have to feed an epsilon to a Turing machine, all you need to do is place blanks to the left and if infinity of the blanks epsilon itself is uh, just a uh, nothing so an infinity of blanks uh, onto the right and the head is somewhere staring at again the blank so that's how you feed an epsilon to a Turing machine by just looking at a blank tape so the input character should could be an actual character or a blank the Turing machine can write a blank in the output character so I take it back, the blank is actually part of the tape alphabet, input alphabet also, um, but there could be other things that makes the sigma, the gamma, a superset of the input alphabet. So there's a small fix uh, needed in the book which I will make, which is that uh, we don't need uh, the tape alphabet to be a 
proper superset of the input alphabet, it could also be the same. It's a simple point down the road, but uh, since I made that misstatement, I will be correcting that. So the blanks are also part of the input. Okay, moving on, um, it can write a blank on the output spot and the head movement specification is uh, right, left or same. Okay, let us look at our first Turing machine, which is uh, called a bit flipper. We can start it with uh, some input return on a tape. Let us say zero. What? Okay, I wrote one zero one 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 zero in a simulation shown below, and the Turing machine head is uh, staring at uh, the left end, with an infinity of blanks to the left and infinity of blanks to the right, and uh, so long as it is looking at our zero, it changes to one and moves right. So long as it's looking at a one, changes to a zero, moves right. So if you fire up such a Turing machine, what it'll do is uh, it'll go ahead and change this to a zero, change this to a one, move right, change this to a zero, move right, zero, move right, zero, move right, one, move right, and then when it hits a blank, it stops. So much like uh, its name or its uh, advertised functionality it simply inverts the contents of the tape that's the actual work it does and it will accept in the final state when it hits the blank so you can think of what the language of the steering machine is does it get bothered by any string you put in the zero one blank star family um, and does it uh, flip um, the entire input should be um, presented without blanks so these are all conventions so if you feed one zero one 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 blank zero blank 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 uh, the Turing machine will get stuck here itself without having flipped to the last bit but that's really not part of the input specification the inputs must be contiguous non-blank separated uh, um, 010110 should be fed this way without blanks inside. And then you can ask whether the steering machines, uh, what the steering machines language is. Um, turns out that um, it'll always go to the final state no matter what you put in. So um, Turing machine has the universal language, but you have to work it out. So the entire uh, description is given here. We also keep a remaining fuel amount in the Turing machine. We load it up with uh, 100 thimbles of uh, fuel. So the instantaneous description is the initial control state, the head position, which is an index into the string, the string itself. So you are staring at uh, zero. Here you are staring at uh, the first cell. Here you are staring at the second cell. Here you are staring at the third cell, zero, third indexed cell, starting from zero fourth index cell, fifth index cell, uh, which is here, etc. And then the sixth index cell is beyond. So at that point it hits the blank and uh, leaves uh, the head in the final state. Each step consumes one thimble of fuel. We keep this fuel so that uh, when the steering machine runs out of fuel, it stops. It allows us to simulate uh, diverging or looping computations inside uh, Joe. So all you do, need to do is uh, specify in a markdown file um, or in the markdown expressed in the Joe screen and the dot object Turing machine paints it, explore Turing machine uh, with the Turing machine name and the input given and the amount of fuel loaded up in the Turing machine. I say gallons here, it could be thimbles, uh, some unit. We can have non-deterministic Turing machines where we put uh, 010010 zero, 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 and the Turing machine doesn't know where the midpoint intended is. So it can take a guess as to here's a midpoint and then try to match around. Uh, then that'll fail. Then it can try to take another guess saying here's a midpoint and then try to get match around. And finally, it'll take the right guess, which is saying here's a match, and then it'll match around. So, non determinism is useful to express codes succinctly. 
and uh, yet non-determinism doesn't increase the power of the Turing machine, it has the same power. The markdown description for recognizing, for writing Turing machine programs is state, read, head, uh, look contents, what you need to write, head direction to state. These descriptions are heavily commented so that um, you understand every step of what is being done, where is the loop head, how is the looping done, under what condition is it branching. So at this point it has uh, become a serious program, assembly program, sort of. So unless you document, it is not possible to understand. Here is a picture that is reasonable, a replacement for the same deterministic Turing machine program. But as you can imagine, with uh, a thousand uh, state program, these would be cluttered and uh, there is no way to attach comments uh, conveniently. <coughs> it would make the diagram cluttered. So this is a good uh, graphical depiction, but uh, the more useful and complete stuff will be found always in a markdown. Here is the execution trace. Uh, XXY, XXY is the final ending state. We started with 0, 0, 001001. 0, 0, 1. This Turing machine changes uh, things, uh, uh, zeros to an X. And uh, once will be changed to a Y. This is just a way to not only denote that these have been scored off, <coughs> but when you look at the final answer, you also know in what way things have been scored off and matched against each other. So don't hesitate to use more tape symbols than needed because the final looks of the tape also tells you whether the work, uh, workings of the Turing machine were correct or not. And to help debug, it's simply a good idea not to score off, say, 001001 with some standard score off character like Z, 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 Z. So that's fine as far as the work itself is concerned, but when you finally look at a tape full of Z's, you don't know what it was before and in what order things happened should you make a mistake. And uh, it's very likely to be making mistakes. So here, if I look at uh, a better chosen description of uh, the tape letters, I know how much work has been done. These were zeros that have been changed to X. It has, this has been matched with uh, this X. This zero is yet to be matched with uh, <coughs> this zero. Here was a uh, one which was changed to a Y. <coughs> Here this Y was uh, being matched. Things like that become clear if you use more symbols. This Turing machine started with 120 thimbles, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ends with uh, 88 thimbles. So that is uh, how much fuel or how many computational steps this Turing machine takes. Here is a non-deterministic version of the same Turing machine, which is uh, doing the following thing. When you look at the input, which is uh, 001001, 001, it uh, keeps sweeping over zeros and ones till it uh, suddenly wakes up and says, I want to ding that spot with an X for a zero or a one for a Y. That's how it uh, selects a midpoint. So here it has assumed that uh, in this uh, little uh, drawing I'm making, it is assuming that this is the midpoint and it knows that it was a zero. But since you want to mark the midpoint, you ding it with uh, some other character co that corresponds to zero, which is X. And then it tries to match this zero against zero, this uh, zero against uh, one, boom, it fails. So that choice of the midpoint is not correct. So back up, back up, back up, back up. You would need to choose that as the midpoint. You could have chosen this as the midpoint. I think that was correct, except the matching is zero against X. 
because x is known to be 0, this 0 against 0, this 1 against 1. So that was the animation that that, mar that uh, midpoint marking would have carried. So, beg your pardon, that was the correct midpoint choice. So, let us now consider another midpoint choice. So, let us say that the cheating machine had chosen, okay, not that one. Let us say, but this one as a midpoint. And that would have been changed not to X, but to Y. So, let us say that it dinged this to a Y, which means I know it is a 1, but I am choosing that as a midpoint. Then the cheating machine will try to match this 0 against this 0 uh, that's the midpoint so it has to match around the midpoint oh no sorry mistake again it has to match around the midpoint so the midpoint is the point at which the right half of the tape belong, uh, begins so it tries to match 0 against y and boom that fails so that is not the correct midpoint so it, it tries a different uh, midpoint cho choices uh, there could be another midpoint choice uh, let us uh, do that in another color Let's say that this is the chosen midpoint. That means this is the presumed beginning of the right end of the tape, right half of the tape. And then the matching begins where this is matched against uh, x which is 0. That's fine. But when it tries to match this against 1, it fails. So you get the idea that uh, this uh, is a non-deterministic uh, Turing machine that doesn't care about there being a middle marker here which says, aha, this is the left, this is the right. It discovers the midpoint, if any, can qualify to be a midpoint, and then match around the midpoint. So this is the midpoint selection, and then it goes to the left till it hits a blank, and then based on the presumed midpoints chosen, it has two major loops now after these loops it uh, comes back and uh, when it is successful it halts otherwise it gets stuck in the reject state so this is the accept state this is the reject state a simulation is shown here showing the correct uh, midpoint selection that started with 170 thimbles and uh, ended at uh, 130 thimbles uh, there are a lot of rejected uh, moves I only show which midpoints were chosen so as to get stuck. So it shows the left end as the midpoint. This is uh, the midpoint, which is still not correct. This is the midpoint. A lot of other midpoints are chosen and the machine gets stuck. The simulation itself um, is uh, accomplished by a simple step function, much simpler than for a PDA. We didn't even bother to show you the code, but here the code for one step of the Turing machine fits on a page. It includes um, keeping the next, uh, it, it keeping a history of how we came to a certain spot. So, given um, instantaneous description, which is a state head index, state head index, tape, and fuel. It uh, also is given a path and the halt list, the path that brought the machine to this uh, instantaneous description. Halt list is all the points that have been previously found to be a halting um, instantaneous description. We had to then later analyze which of these are accepting, which of these are not. Then it uh, dissects the state, head index, tape, fuel out of the given quantity immediately extends the path to the given path plus the ID and then um, if the end of the tape is being looked at it allocates uh, this many uh, tape cells you simply take the blank blank of the Turing machine and allocate that many blank cells then if it is not supported if this move is not supported by the delta function then uh, you're done you're going to just return what uh, you generated uh, as uh, the new list of ID path which it didn't change uh, currently the new list is nothing um, um, otherwise you apply the transition function get the next uh, set of uh, states and then iterate over that list of next set of states 
again if it moves uh, to the left allocate uh, tape cells adjust the head head, in, head index uh, to move over the allocation size and then uh, based on the contents of the tape and the head direction adjust the new list ID path okay so now that's the main function you can study how the rest of the code is written this is the non-deterministic Turing machine and its um, code in Markdown very well commented with a V's and a few's and ahas so you're really boing is bouncing back and all that so you get a good idea of uh, how this uh, machine works um, rather than just look at a sterile diagram okay now we can start uh, coding fun problems uh, one of the first problems we are going to code is called the 3x plus 1 problem or collapses problem so given any x uh, if it is 1 return 1 if it is uh, even recurs on the number divided by 2 otherwise recurs on 3x plus 1 this is a celebrated problem whose halting is unknown not because of any Turing connection it is just uh, one of these curious mathematical functions whose uh, um, range is uh, known to be 1 uh, to the extent we have tested but uh, we don't have any proof that the range of this uh, recursive function is 1 so if you fire it on 3 it stops at 1 191 stops at 1 this number stops at 1 anything that you try stops at 1 and people have run this um, to 2 raised to 60 they were also building special purpose hardware to study this function so far there is no proof that this function will always return 1 but it so seems the reason is that this function will give an x dance about and then finally hit 1 and these dances are not well characterized in terms of any known mathematical function here's a nice markdown that uh, comes uh, not marked on the diagram for the collapse encoding it's a beautiful Turing machine written by my uh, researcher staff researcher student Ian and the execution for the collapse uh, problem loaded with any number like 5 will end in 1 on the tape uh, it allocates tape cells in the middle so you can see the tape cells allocated as the computation proceeds to the left and the right this is the markdown it has a very nice uh, documentation number was in one go to number is even divide go to all this uh, comments uh, tell you exactly how this go to based uh, Turing machine program is written now comes uh, the important concept in this chapter which is called the Chomsky hierarchy the languages we have studied are regular context free context sensitive we didn't study much we mentioned and recursively enumerable which we are going to mention again languages of DFA and FA are regular PDAs are context free there is a deterministic PDA it gives you deterministic context free linear bounded automata give you context sensitive deterministic and non-deterministic Turing machines have recursively enumerable languages Purely right or left linear productions in a CFG sense is what um, gives you DFA. We have seen that. Even DPDA and NPDA have ordinary context free productions. Um, DPDA have deterministic productions. Each left hand side has one non terminal, that is the property of context free productions. But if you allow left hand sides uh, to have more uh, non terminals, then, uh, then you get uh, either context sensitive or recursively enumerable. So, context sensitive production has multiple things on the left hand side. So, this A expansion is allowed in the context of A and D to keeping AD and this A is getting expanded so to speak to AC so A expanded to AC happens in the context of A and D that's a context sensitive production but uh, if you want to stay in this uh, family 
context sensitive you have to have the left hand side uh, number of symbols to be less than or equal to right hand side number of symbols but if you mix uh, the increasing and decreasing so if some left hand sides have more some left hand sides have less then you are in the recursively enumerable family so it's very interesting that all these machine forms have real machine types that model them the language forms have machine types that model them and also grammar types uh, that uh, model the languages so this uh, triumvirate of uh, connections looks like a complete accident of history chomsky was working on grammars from the linguistic department linguistics department these were being developed by computational theorists and uh, there is uh, this magical connection Chomsky hierarchy which is one of the pivotal results of uh, computer science that happened to be discovered by computer scientists it apparently exists uh, in nature and CS researchers happen to just discover it so recursively enumerable language is the language of a Turing machine that's all so whenever you have a language and you define a Turing machine you are getting a recursively enumerable language nothing more to it much like uh, Pushed-on automata define context-free uh, languages and so on. So here are some exercises to design uh, Turing machines have been given. Please try these. Some of them are for DTM design, some for NDTM design. I think that finishes uh, this chapter. The real beauty of recursively enumerable and recursive languages is uh, not uh, fully explored yet. We are going to be doing that. We need to fix this uh, book. Um, the idea is that uh, we really need these computational devices in the grand scheme of things. Humans have not been around that long and the computers have not been around that long. So to clearly explain ideas in this space, we need primitive devices. Tomorrow if you define a carbon nanotube computer or a protoplasmic computer, uh, sorry, a carbon nanotube based transistor or a protoplasm um, atom bacteria based uh, transistor. The first thing you would try to do is uh, build an AND gate and AND gate and then perhaps a finite state machine and then if uh, luck holds you might try to build a Turing machine. This may test out whether computation can be supported by carbon nanotubes or bacteria. You would not be building a MacBook Pro at that point. Uh, as the first step. Suppose you want to communicate what a computation is uh, to a space alien. Uh, that space alien has a better chance of understanding a Turing machine than a regular computer uh, such as a Mac or a PC or an Android. So if you have to send uh, something uh, that was sent in the Voyager spacecraft uh, to exoplanets uh, they sent uh, little plaques of uh, humans and what they looked like and uh, what this periodic table was. Uh, maybe they should have included a Turing machine model also. Then they would have known when they receive it that we here in Earth on Earth have dealt with computation. Maybe they have dealt with computation using some other data structures here. All right, so. Till next chapter, enjoy this material. Uh, we need to now look at the Joe part of the course. The Joe part is uh, the flipper Turing machine. It's all loaded and ready to go. And uh, here is the flipper Turing machine. Exploring the flipper gives you this computational history. Let's uh, build the W pound W machine. Uh, the edges come with uh, multiple uh, transitions. We know by now that fuse edges is a nice thing to run. So here itself I could have uh, run uh, comma fuse edges equal to true and then it could have uh, <coughs> I didn't put it in there right place maybe or uh, it didn't uh, 
okay in the dot object it should put be put not here <coughs> so let us put it here and so the edges are fused and you see this is a better diagram to look at so we will need fused edges uh, in almost all examples here okay see so here is the WW non-deterministic Turing machine uh, look at uh, how impressive it is um, but again it merits a few edges and uh, then it'll look much more manageable cleaner well shaven look okay now here is the non deterministic Turing machine being explored here is an adder Turing machine which adds two numbers in base 2 it was a heroic act of programming by Ian before I developed my markdown you can look at uh, the adder Turing machine. Uh, it's a pretty impressive diagram. Um, lots of states, a lot of transitions. And again, with fuse edges, it becomes cleaner to look at. It's uh, an addition Turing machine that is uh, adding all kinds of uh, numbers, uh, two binary numbers. So we can add uh, these two binary numbers and then uh, it runs and then it allocates uh, enough tape and then the results of the addition are um, present in the tape this is the addition result done all right so now decimal doubling is a machine that doubles a decimal again it looks uh, like a pretty Turing machine when you draw it using few edges and decimal double of 231 is uh, going to result in 462 so it's a beautiful algorithm 231 getting doubled to 462 all done by Turing machine here's the Collatz problem and then Collatz for uh, 5 halts at uh, tape containing 1 it always should halt at 1 this is a shift left Turing machine that shifts a given a pattern like here ABA ABA has been shifted to ABA AB with a blank and A. So it is going to shift the blank to the left through the string. This is a shift right Turing machine, etc. So you can study any of these and then hopefully you will write some more Turing machines on your own based on these examples. Thank you.